Um, I've given up trying to work with the uh, with the um, with the Mac side. I've given up working with the Windows side, so I'm working Windows on a Mac. Anything could happen, but anyway, I've hit it with a hammer. The orthopedic approach. We'll see what goes on. Um, we're going to talk about uh, surgical concerns in ankle instability, and. Um, uh, we certainly know that the ATFL is the first or perhaps the only ligament uh, to be injured in, in two-thirds of, two of patients. That's going back some years. And the grading system is, you know, the orthopedic approach. It's, only, it's not going to go up to four because we can't count beyond three, most of us. Um, but it's always very difficult to understand exactly what the one, two, and three is, either with clinical examination or indeed uh, radiologically, I find. However, we know that Improper treatment leads to uh, late complications in uh, 30 or 40 percent of individuals. Well, I talked about hindfoot varus beforehand. Um, sure, hindfoot varus is a potential problem. Um, I personally, and I know people do talk about it, I personally have never been brave enough to correct a hindfoot varus in an elite athlete. Um, I have done it in other people who have had chronic instability and they've had re recurrent falls and uh, we, I've had to actually use a hamstring graft and things like this rather than using a brostrum. Personally, I'd like to throw it open to the audience later on if anyone thinks we should be correcting the hindfoot. But I think that, uh, uh, that uh, elite athletes will hate me for changing any position of their heel. But I'll have to open for the uh, for thing. Oh, look, it works. Right. There is, you can have a chronic repetitive injury. Now, this is, a, he's not a soccer player. He's a um, it's sports specific, but he's a cricket player. He's a bar fast bowler, Indian fast bowler. But that comes down there, and he has a chronically lax ankle. And obviously, that the depends upon the position of your foot when you're landing. Quite a lot of uh, bowlers have landed with their foot uh, inverted slightly, and they get a, uh, more of a lateral injury. But there are chronic injuries that occur in sportsmen um, in, in soccer as well. So the gold standard, I think, is delayed clinical assessment, because you can't do this when there's a big hematoma present. And I tried to delay it by four or five days. Once again, it's arguing with a, a few uh, type A personality managers. You can localize the pain and try to get an anterior draw at that stage. If you examine them immediately on the pitch, I don't have that luxury. I'm not allowed on the pitch nowadays. I'm not qualified, and, uh, not qualified as, uh, to go on premiership pitches as for the last four years. Um, but if you examine it in the changing room straight afterwards, maybe you can get the good examination. But by and large, if they see me 12 hours later, maybe six hours later, or even the following day, it's all pretty sore everywhere. So I prefer it, uh, uh, rather than 48 hours, I prefer it four or five days later. Uh, Nick Van Dyke in his thesis years ago said, if there's no pain over the ATFL, there's no acute rupture. And I think that holds, holds true today. What do I do? Yes, the anterior draw test is important. Taylor tilt, that's really quite difficult. I certainly don't do the Taylor tilt like this. I can't actually feel how much that tilt is actually going on. I find it very difficult to assess that. All I can tell you is I know when it's acutely ruptured and it just swings in. I can tell you that. Grading it, I don't know. I'd leave that open to the panel later on. But I find that particularly difficult. But we know that if you do results of anatomical reconstruction in the, uh, in the, in the chronic cases, it's 95% successful with an anatomical reconstruction, except in the generalized joint laxity groups. Uh, I deal with quite a lot of the raw belly, and, and they, have, they are the most impossible group to treat in that they want complete stability, but ultimate mobility as well. And I know they take, by my view, they take twice as long as any other uh, sportsman to get back to, uh, get back to sport again. You can get them to do the anterior draw. This is acutely in a quite a tough uh, Scottish <laughs> uh, soccer player. He was doing his own anterior draw. And this was done six years ago, uh, five years ago, sorry, when I didn't used to do many acute lateral ligament reconstructions. I treated them conservatively and we went through. And then we started seeing a few come back. But the, uh, the physio said, James, you want to fix this one. It's really, really lax. And he hadn't had a f And so he sent him down. I said, look, I don't fix them. And he sent him down. And he did that test to me. And he just rocked his ankle back and forth and went, I think you're probably going to get an operation. You can do fluoroscopy, sure. You can do fluoroscopy. It, um, it's, it's often rarely required. I don't, I, don't tend to, I don't tend to use it. Like I said, I use uh, uh, the MRI scans, the certainly associated injury, bone, chondral. Certainly, I would agree that uh, CT, uh, CT arthrogram, we use a lot more nowadays than I did even two years ago because I found that particularly useful for finding those, just those isolated chondral lesions that you haven't got any bony part to it. And I found that very useful. And ultrasound, once again, I've gone about it, but I like ultrasound with the lateral ligament injuries. And certainly you can do a dynamic ultrasound. You can show the anterior drawer. You can see how much displacement there is. Well, I can't, but my radiologist can, and he can tell me. 
What I was going to talk about here, the surgical strategies, well, what are the causes for sort of chronic pain? We all see it later on after an ankle injury. Well, 20 to 40 percent have a chronic instability and have, have, have chronic instability and have chronic pain. It's unsure exactly what the cause is. There are at-risk structures that Di Giovanni talked about, and, they and he described them as bony and soft tissue uh, st structures. So we know that you can have an osteochondral lesion. You know, may occur without a history of trauma, yes, and 10% may be bilateral with no traumatic. But the lateral are usually traumatic. And on MRI scan, you usually get bone edema. That's the deep ankle pain you get after an ankle, after an ankle injury. There are other ones that get missed occasionally. These are all uh, professional athletes who got missed. Um, the anterior process fractures, um, they, c they come back again and will give uh, uh, um, uh, ankle pain, of sort of lateral ankle pain, but it's nothing to do with the actual ankle itself. Uh, possible association with ATFL injury. There's a retrospective uh, study from five years ago that looked at that. And certainly you can pick them up once again on MRI scan. Perhaps there's a reason for getting an MRI scan at 72 hours, as I was talking about earlier on. You may pick this up because it's all a bit sore after, after 40, 48, 72 hours. And he looks pretty daft if you miss one of those. There is an association with fifth metatarsal fractures with an inversion injuries. I won't go on about that. There's also quite an instance of, in, of problems with the, uh, with the perineal tendons. Uh, Carol Fry, back in 96, I think this was with Pierce Granton, he, she wrote about uh, the uh, 15 acute sprains and 50% had tenus vitals on MRI scans. And Di Giovanni looked at 77% of patients at surgery um, for lateral ligament injuries. 38% had a positive MRI, but 94% had positive clinical findings of perineal tendon uh, disorders. And if we look at this, so Marco looked at this, Lateral ligament reconstruction, they, uh, 11 of his 47 had rents in the perineus brevis. 27% uh, had perineus brevis tears, 13% uh, longus tears, and that, and that was in Carol Fry's uh, uh, study. And how do we predict it? Well, 25% ankle sprains have uh, tears at surgery. 80% uh, were, were positive on the MRI scan, uh, and there was no false positive rate. So once again, they suggest it's an it's, uh, MRI scan. What do I think? I prefer, I don't know, I'll take, I'll, take your, uh, Nabil, I'll take your advice on this, but I prefer the ultrasound because the radiologist can show me exactly what's going on there. So if it's not on MRI scan but they've got pain there, I get that. Certainly, clinically, you can get a uh, dislocation and you can have an attenuated SPR in chronic lateral ligament injury in up to 50%, 23 to 50%, if you look at it carefully. And you can get a, certainly you can get a clinical uh, dislocation really quite, quite, really quite easily. I'm going to go through some of these slides re reasonably quickly as <coughs> Chairman's prerogative to try and make up a little bit of time. But one of the other things, Paolo Galano's uh, st uh, got a picture down here, but one of the things we've got here is the, is the, is the uh, cutaneous branch of the superficial perineal nerve. There are, often, there are two branches coming across there, and that gives that, if you get a pen, just a simple thing of just getting a pen and rubbing it across this anterior aspect of the ankle joint, they can sometimes get a, a, that pain coming up from that stretched nerve. And I see that more and more. And it's nothing to do with anterolateral impingement, which has been often been sent to me. It doesn't seem to get better with an injection into the capsule because it's not inside the capsule, it's in the, in the, in the, uh, in the nerve. But we're seeing this relatively frequently and we've been using capsaicin cream and I send them off to other pain doctors to get treated. Another thing is, I'll put this slide in here. I'm um, thank goodness it, it showed. You know I was talking about the AITFL earlier on. I bravely put this one in there just to see if it works and thank you for it plays. That's the AITFL, all right? That's been pulled off. There's the tibia up here, the fibula across there. It's been pulled off and I'm fiddling with it there and it's just hanging down in the breeze, swinging down in the anterolateral gutter. So you can get this anterolateral soft tissue impingement at a later stage during the recovery or even at an early stage in this case if it's just jamming in the ankle. Classically, the patients get better, better, better in about five to six weeks stage. They begin to get this anterolateral impingement pain and then you go down the injection route. Gamble plays off occasionally. So if we look at the treatment phase from my orthopedic point of view, we go, we'll go through this very quickly and I'll ignore most of this actually uh, to make up a little bit of time. But there, is a, there are the different phases, the five to seven days and the proliferative phase, which is uh, 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 up to 12 weeks and then it still remodels for up to a year. If we look at what is actually then, if you leave them in a cast for ages, it 
it doesn't do them any good, good, uh, any good at all. Gina Kerskoff looked at that. A longer mobilization is definitely detrimental. If we look at the different parts of this, um, controlled stress certainly promotes collagen fiber orientation, so we need to get them going at a reasonable time. Motion certainly is, 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 is better than the, uh, anything else. So from a surgeon's point of view, I still get them aggressive. Uh, rehabilitation is what I try and say it. And Brian, I leave it up to Brian English and people like this who know a lot more about it. As an orthopedic surgeon, I know that much, probably a little bit less about rehabilitation, uh, but I'll leave it up to them. But I want them to move pretty quickly. And certainly I think that taping, by and large, for the elite athlete is better than functional bracing. I think uh, Gino looked at that as well on the database. Um, and, uh, but you can't, I can't use that in my normal practice because taping has uh, loads of side effects such as skin problems and everything else, and they just don't tape them properly and they become loose. But in a match, they obviously get them done quickly. Um, when we looked at whether you should mobilize them, there was this paper from The Lancet, which is, I think it's a tremendous journal, but this is a pretty bad paper. There's a, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine uh, paper came out of this journal as well, which is, isn't great. But it certainly seemed to suggest that um, uh, a short period of mobilization is very good, but it was really, really bad. There was very many distortions. The data was postal questionnaires. There was a 17% dropout after just one month, and it got no idea about respray. So I think this paper needs to be redone. Maybe, maybe you could do that again, Aspartar. Maybe you could do that over here, because it, it, it could be great to redo it. And whether you should brace or tape, there are loads of uh, ones out there, but by and large, taping is, uh, is, 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 is better, but it has got problems with it. I'm gonna leave these ones alone. And the evidence for non-steroidals, this is, I've had this debate with a, with a sports physician uh, just on Thursday before I came out here. Um, I don't know, every year there seems to be something else come out about non-steroidals are good at this stage, but not good at that stage. And I think it's bucket chemistry. I'd, 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 I'd like to take a, take a poll and see when, when you use them and where, but uh, I haven't got a, a complete handle on it at the moment. Well, additional treatments from a surgeon. Well, there was a, back in 2000, operative treatment is the best option. However, the Cochrane database, Gino looked at this um, with the Cochrane, Cochrane reviews, um, and functional treatment is superior to six weeks in a cast. And operative treatment is more stability, and functional treatment, maybe that's the best option. So that's been the treatment so far. And that's what I was doing. I'm not gonna go into that role of PRP. Um, uh, but maybe there's a role for surgery. Yes, in the chronic injury, they pelt, repairs well. Most acute injuries are treated non-operatively. But we're talking about this, increased stiffness with surgery. There may be some complications, and, uh, but there, ultimately there is less instability. So why would I bother repairing for the last five and a half, six years, lateral ligaments in, in, the, sports, in the sportsman or the elite athlete? Well, I know there's less instability. And residual instability, as we've spoken about in a previous injury, is a, uh, a predictor of repeat ankle sprains. We know that. And we know that the results of, uh, uh, of operative intervention are good. However, these results have been looked at in chronic in, 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 for chronic instability. Uh, we looked at this in, in Warsaw last year, and we, did, uh, we looked at uh, single surgeons with high volume series and elite athletes, and they appeared to have better results. And Gino's gone on to, and is hopefully going to publish uh, this uh, with Nick uh, later, uh, either uh, probably next year now. And I certainly think there is an adherence to training program is certainly very important, um, uh, and we know, we know about that. I'm gonna move through this one fairly quickly. So in summary, I think in elite athletes, I think it should be, they should be treated conservatively if they have a grade one injury. And functional rehab is very good. The role of non-steroidals for the first five days, I don't know. I'm told that's a good thing to do. And then, and then get them back and uh, stop, stop the non-steroidals. However, I'll come on to this now. The grade two and three injuries, you can put them in, treat them conservatively with, uh, with lace up and functional brace. However, my practice now, uh, which may be controversial, is when you've got a combined ATFL and CFL rupture, and when you examine them, there are some people who've got stiff joints and some people who've got lax joints. And the stiff joints, if you sit there and pull on it and they've had an ATFL, CFL rupture, I'll treat them conservatively. But when you've got that Scottish player I had there, when you sit there and he, you can pull on his ankle and he's almost dislocating it, I feel that he's got a high risk, and there's evidence there to suggest he's got a high risk of having a recurrence injury. And so therefore, we've, begin, we've, been mo we've moved to re repair in the acute stages if they're unstable and they've got a combined injury. 
And if we look at when we can get patients back with conservative management, uh, sure, it's about 12 weeks if we've got a combined complete rupture. Um, but with operative management, we should be able to get them back in exactly the same time. And in fact, if you should, you should be able to during the earlier stages, it should be more stable. So you should be able to accelerate this rehabilitation. And so far, we've been moving them back to get them back at, a, at an accelerated rehab time in, uh, within the, sort of the 10 week stages, rather than waiting for the 12 weeks. There is no good evidence to support it, other than the fact that single surgeon series have a uh, stable ankle with less recurrent uh, uh, dislocate, uh, injuries, but they do have a little bit more stiffness. How much stiffness actually matters in the long run, we do not know. Um, but maybe that's where Rob was talking about earlier on. There is a risk of, of complications such as skin infection. Yeah, you can, yes, but by and large, that's pretty low. So I put it out there as a, as a debating issue more than anything else. But there is some evidence for it. And I think this is probably the way that we, we tend to be going with the elite athletes today. And that's uh, for any of you Aussies out there feeling a bit homesick. Thank you.